Good afternoon, and as always, a very warm welcome to our Tuesday lunchtime service here at Gilcomson. It's a pleasure to have you joining with us, and we do trust and pray always that it'll be a time of real refreshment and blessing for you as we get our eyes back on the Lord. Let's then join together in the worship of God in the singing of the hymn, or Jesus, I have promised. Let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Gracious God, our Father, it's always good for us to be able to gather and to bring to you the praise and the worship of our hearts, to know that although we are separated in all sorts of different ways, bringing to you our worship from different places, nonetheless, we come by the same means to the same God and rejoice in the same Holy Spirit. We thank you, our Father, for Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you that he has provided the way for us that we may follow and find in him life in all its fullness. 
We thank you, living God, that you declare you have no pleasure in the death of any and therefore bid us always turn from the folly of our own ways to find in your Son the one in whom there is forgiveness, the one through whom we discover a new start, the one who makes us new people, the one who puts us on our feet and gives to us a new future and opens to us a new life and a new destiny. How we bless you for that, our God. How we thank you for your mercy and your kindness towards us. We don't deserve even the least of your kindness. We have gone astray. We've gone our own way, done our own thing. We've scorned your word, neglected your will, and simply pursued our own agenda so often. We are and have been rebels, our God, but we recognize and acknowledge the folly of our ways. We recognize the heinousness of our sin before yourself. And we seek to bring to you the praise and the worship that is your due. For you are our maker. You are our God. You are our king. You have been pleased to deal so kindly with us. And we gladly bring to you our worship and sound out the praise of your own great name. A God altogether wise and good and true and strong and kind and full of mercy. We pray, living God, that as we thus bring to you our worship, as we seek to learn from your word, that by your Holy Spirit you would speak into our hearts again to refresh, to renew, to encourage, to challenge, and to help us in all our different circumstances. Grant, living God, that we may know you present with us, therefore, as we gather thus in the name of your Son, and to his name be all the praise and all the glory now and always. Amen. Well, we're going to be turning again to the book of Ruth, to chapter 1 in the book of Ruth. We're going to read verses 6 to 18 today in uh, the, um, uh, the Bible, Ruth chapter 1. If you have a Bible to hand, you might like just to turn to that. The theme, broadly speaking, that we'll be picking up this morning, is, uh, this afternoon, is uh, that of choices, the need that we have to make a choice. And you'll see that it is the narrative of the two daughters-in-law of Naomi. Naomi had left the land of Egypt, gone to the land of Moab, and uh, there uh, her two sons had married two Moabite uh, ladies, Ruth and Orpah. And the two sons had died along with Naomi's husband. And we pick up the story in verse 6 of chapter 1. Let us hear the word of God. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she'd been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness. If you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Amen. And may God add his blessing to that reading of his word and to our study of it today. 
Uh, it is, as I say, the, the story of um, the challenge to choice. It's the story here that we're going to focus on of two ladies, one called Opa and the other called Ruth. In some ways, they're very similar to one another. They come from the same land. They have the same experience. They've both been married. They've both been early widowed. They both hear the same message that Naomi has heard, and they're both faced by the same challenge. So in many regards, Orpah and Ruth are, are very similar. Um, there's not a huge lot between them in terms of the difference that we might make. But they make two very different decisions, and they ultimately enjoy two very different destinies. Uh, I doubt that many people have heard of Orpah. And you mention the name Orpah, probably people think of Oprah rather than Orpah. That's, that's the nearest you ever get to this lady having any sort of fame at all. Orpah simply drifts off into oblivion, and Ruth, by contrast, becomes one through whom ultimately God's own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be born. She, she moves into an arena where, and everything hinges on the choice that they make. Uh, one goes into oblivion, and one enters into uh, a lasting destiny of significance. And, and really, the reason why the book is there in the Bible for us is that we might recognize the same choice is always there before us. Um, the Bible from beginning to end is, is really setting that choice before us. And the, the choice in the Bible is always binary. That's to say there isn't a third way. Um, it is one way or the other way, and there's, there's nothing in between. There's no fence to sit on. There's no kind of middle path of compromise. Either you are in or you are out. Either it's oblivion or it is significance. And, and that narrative runs really from the very beginning of the Bible with the story in Genesis chapter 4 of Abel and Cain. Um, one uh, recognizes that the only way he may approach the living God is by the exercise of faith on the basis of a sacrifice that is made on his behalf. The other, Cain, believes that he can, he can please God and find favor with God by the works that he does, by the produce that he creates, and so on, and he seeks thereby to buy from his own resources the favor of God, and, and one lives, one dies, one has a future, one has no future at all. And right the way through the Bible, it is this same choice. Till at the very death of the Son of God on the cross, he is flanked by two thieves, two men who have gone way wrong in their lives, two men who have gone their own way and done their own thing and ended up a total uh, train wreck of, of a life. And, and one on either side, one trusts him, the other scorns him. One is in heaven, one is in hell. And that's the choice that is set starkly before us in that graphic picture as Jesus dies. There is a choice to be made. Are you for him or are you against him? And the terms in which the Bible regularly speaks about this choice are, are pretty stark terms. It is life or death. It is blessing or curse. It is uh, for the Lord or against the Lord. It is choosing the Lord or choosing yourself. It is ultimately heaven or hell itself. You find um, Moses speaks in those terms in Deuteronomy chapter 30 at verse 19, I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him for the Lord is your life. And Jesus himself obviously spoke about these two ways, either the narrow way of following him, trusting in him, and, and seeking simply to have him order our lives and enable us in our living, or the broad way, a kind of way of comfort, a way of pride, a way where you do it yourself. And, and, and that's a broad way, and it leads, he says, to destruction. The narrow way leads to life. You've got to choose which path you're going to go on, which way you're going to live life. And the, um, the way in which the Apostle John uh, puts it is, is very stark indeed at the end of his first letter. He says, this is the testimony. He's talking about God's testimony, God's message, not a complicated message. Although the Bible is a big book, the message is, is very simple, very clear, and very constant. This is the testimony, God's testimony. What is it? God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, says John. Whoever has the Son has life. 
Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's what it boils down to. Either you have Jesus or you don't have Jesus. Either you choose Jesus or you don't choose Jesus. Either you have life or you don't have life. Either you have a future or you don't have a future. Either you have heaven or you have hell. It is a stark, stark choice that the Bible presents to us. And it is a constant binary choice that is set before us. And that's what we find in this narrative here. Two women. Which way are you going to go, Orpa? Which way are you going to go, Ruth? There's the choice. And it's that that I want us to think about just briefly this afternoon. Um, there is, first of all, and um, this is important for us to ask, there is, first of all, always a period when you get to think. It is never blind faith, in other words, that we are called upon to exercise. Always there is um, background given to us so that we make an informed choice as to which path we will follow. What are you going to make of your life? Where are you going to go in your life? How are you going to live your life? And you'll see here that um, as it was with Orpah and Ruth, almost invariably it is with ourselves as well, that there are these three major factors that play into this time of reflection. All of us are given that, that time, that space. Sometimes it's quite a long time, sometimes it's not so long, uh, but there is that period where, where we are exposed to factors that help inform our choice. And broadly speaking, they are these three. You find them here with Orpah and Ruth. There is, first of all, the experience of Moab. What's it like living in Moab? Do you really want to live on there? What have you, brought, what have you d discovered and experienced in Moab? What they've known is simply bereavement and death. Moab is a dead end. Do you really want to go on living there? That's their experience. They've experienced something of what life in Moab, existence in Moab, brings to them. Do you really like that? Is it really satisfying? Does it really meet the deepest needs of your heart? The answer surely is no. There's surely more to life than that. But that experience plays into the, the moment of choice. Um, they, they've begun to discover that that which they maybe thought would satisfy doesn't really satisfy at all. Secondly, there is, alongside the experience of Moab, there is the message of hope. You see there in verse 6, Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people. The Lord had visited his people, is the terminology that's used, and had provided bread for them, provided them what, what they need. The Lord himself active and coming into their uh, life coming into their world, coming into their experience. That's the message that they heard. That's the message that we hear. In the face of a, an existence that is dissatisfying, there is the message sounded out about God having sent his son Jesus into this world who is the bread of life, who does satisfy, who does meet the longing that we have for relationship, the longing that we have for um, a real uh, significance in our living. He comes into this world in order to secure that for us. And that's the the message that they heard, the message that we hear as well, God has come to the aid of his people. God has come into this world. We hear that message. They heard that message. So there is the experience of Moab. There is the message of hope. And then there is, thirdly, the testimony of faith, the testimony of other Christians around us. In other words, Orpah and uh, Ruth here have seen in Naomi a woman of faith. She is flawed in a lot of ways, certainly. She's not the finished article by any means, but she is clearly a woman of faith. A faith that will certainly grow as the story develops, but a faith that has been evident to them. They have seen, first of all, her submission to her husband as part of her submission to the Lord. Here's a woman who is who is being ready to place her life under the lordship of her God, and therefore, as an expression of that, has gone with her husband, whose name Elimelech simply means, uh, my God is king. And she, she acknowledges the kingship of God in her life. They've seen her submission 
to her husband and to her Lord. They have seen her reaction to suffering. They've seen the way in which she, she handles that, that she hasn't kind of flung herself off the edge. She hasn't gone wild. She has, she has coped with it. She has handled with it. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. She's known bereavement in a strange land, but she has managed to handle that, managed to cope with that. She, they have seen her reaction to suffering, and they've seen her resolve to return. They have seen that uh, rigorous desire on the part of this woman to be where the Lord is, to be in his land. And so they have, uh, alongside their own experience of deadness in the land of Moab, they have heard this message and they have seen what faith looks like in the life of this woman. And so they have had that period when they got to think, they got to reflect for themselves about how, how am I going to live my life? And you also and I, we get that time to think. And then also there is not only a period when you get to think, there is a point where you have to choose. That's the second thing that I want us to think around here. There comes a point in your life where you have to choose and the choice is that binary choice. Are you for Jesus or are you against Jesus? Is it life in its fullness that you're going to have or is it ultimately a dead end existence that you're going to have? Is it heaven or is it hell that will be your final destiny? Is it the blessing of God or the curse of God? that will be your experience, which you're going to choose. Which way are you going to go? Are you going to follow Jesus and be with Jesus, or are you going to turn your back on him? And, and there isn't a middle way where you can just kind of uh, uh, amble along and say, well, I've nothing against him, but uh, you know, don't ask me to follow him like that. There is not that middle way. Either you are for him or you are against him. And uh, that's not me saying that, that's Jesus himself underlining that you're either for me or you're against me. You're either with me or you're without me. Uh, you either have life or you don't have life. Which is it going to be? You choose. And there comes this point for Orpah and Ruth where they have to choose. What are they going to do? And there will come that point for you if it's not come already in your life where you have to choose. And it's a big, big choice that determines not only the next couple of days in your life, but determines your eternal destiny. And uh, Orpah and Ruth here are presented to us precisely because it is stark and clear as daylight that Orpah is oblivion. No one knows about Orpah. No one hears anything more about Orpah. She is, she is reduced to nothing. It is no future at all that she has. Ruth, by contrast, um, most folk know what happens with Ruth. Most folk are aware of the way in which she, she is wonderfully brought into a life of huge ultimate significance whereby she brings into the world the very Son of God. There's a lot at stake. And it's important, therefore, that we recognize what the nature of this faith is, because it's, it's very starkly drawn between Orpah and Ruth here. And in Orpah, we see what saving faith is not. You are not saved, in other words, by proxy. Orpah is not saved because she happens to be the daughter-in-law of Naomi. She's not able to cling to Naomi's faith and say, well, you know what, Naomi is, she's a believer and therefore I'll be okay because I'm kind of with her in some sort of roundabout way. You cannot uh, say, well, my granny was a Christian and therefore, you know, basically I must be a Christian or I was born in Scotland, therefore I must be a Christian. You don't get to be saved by proxy. And uh, uh, we, we, um, we lead ourselves astray if for a moment we assume that somehow faith means that we, we just have some association with someone who happens to be a Christian. You're not saved by proxy. Secondly, we learn that you're not saved by profession of faith. You see what uh, Orpah has done First of all, we find verse 7 that she has set out on the road with Naomi. 
she's kind of hit the road that is signposted, Judah and Bethlehem. And she's on the road. She's, she's kind of stood there, got on that road with Naomi. And she has said, verse, verse 10, we will go back with you to your people. She's, she's professed faith. She said, yeah, you know, I'm on the road and that's where I'm going. That's profession. You're not saved by a profession of faith. I've sometimes come across uh, individuals who, who are, are making a total wreck of their lives and who are living in a way that is a million miles away from following the Lord Jesus Christ, but who will say, but I've been saved. And I say, well, well uh, how on earth can you say I've been saved? And they say, well, I, I, I made a profession of faith. 10 years ago, whatever it may have been, I made a profession of faith and I, I said, Jesus, I'm yours. I have, I have made that profession. I'm okay. And I said, well, you're not okay. You're not saved by a profession of faith. And equally, and it's important to get this as well, we're not saved by proxy. We're not saved by profession and we're not saved by our piety or by any expressions of piety here as well. Orpah, we read verse 10. Um, kissed Naomi and wept. You might think, well, that's pretty effusive and that's a pretty expressive of, you know, where her heart really is. And, uh, and that's pious. Um, that's, that's kind of piety uh, given full reign in our lives where you, you kind of say all the right things and do all the right things and engage in all the right rituals like that. That's what she's doing. She is being very pious here. I don't doubt that she meant it. I don't doubt that she, 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 she had tears in her heart at the prospect of, of uh, losing Naomi because she was dear to, to her and so on. And, and she kisses her like that. Both of them do that. Ruth weeps. Ruth kisses her. Uh, Orpah kisses her. Orpah weeps like that. There are these expressions of piety, but that is not faith. So to do the, the religious ritual, to pitch up at worship Sunday by Sunday, to say, well, I say my prayers and I read the Bible. I, I kind of do all the right things. All of that is very pious, but it is not saving faith so far as the Bible is concerned. And it doesn't get you into life. It doesn't bring you to know the Lord Jesus Christ at all. That's Orpah. And, and it's important to recognize in Orpah here, although in some ways she, she is quite similar to Ruth, um, she's, she's very different in the decision that she finally makes and takes. So let's get that clear. We're not saved by proxy, we're not saved by profession, and we're not saved by piety. And you ask, well, what are we saved by? And you see that in Ruth. There's a distinction. Ruth, we are told, clung to her, verse 14, at this they wept aloud again, or kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Um, that's the word that is uh, used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, about a man and a woman who cleave to one another, who commit themselves to one another in a lasting, binding, enduring bond of love. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united or cleaves to, is clinging to his wife, united inseparably to his wife. That's the word that is used. And it is the word that the Lord himself uses again and again through the book of Deuteronomy. Precisely that word, fear the Lord your God and serve him, hold fast to him. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20. Carefully observe all these commands I'm giving you to follow, to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to hold fast to him. Chapter 11, verse 22. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. Keep his commands, obey him, serve him, and hold fast to him. That relational commitment, that absolute abandoning of yourself to the Lord. That's what we find in Ruth. And that's the distinction between her and Orpah. Orpah has has that proxy. She is closely related to a woman of faith. She does have that profession of faith on the road, and yet yeah, we'll go there. She's professed that faith, and yes, there are these expressions of piety, but none of that, none of that is a substitute for that relational commitment. 
that Ruth gives expression to here that is entirely in line with the terminology of the call of God to us all in Scripture. Same word in the passage that I read earlier from Deuteronomy chapter 30 when Moses speaks, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may, may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. Cling to him, for the Lord is your life. Cling to him. Relationally, give yourself to him. Now, that's the challenge, and that's the choice. And there comes that point where, having had the time to reflect and to think and to recognize the, the experience that we've had of deadness, the message that God has given of hope in Jesus Christ, and the testimony of other Christians around us. We do the maths, and we make that choice. And always, it is a step of faith that we take. There was a remarkable book written um, many years ago by a guy called Sheldon Vanneken, called A Severe Mercy. Uh, he was uh, a very able, academically able man who studied under C.S. Lewis um, and who was much helped in all his thinking. He basically was a pagan who, who began to have to think about the meaning of life and, and the claims of Jesus Christ. And uh, he, he reached a point, having had that time to reflect, when he realized that there was a choice. This is what he wrote. It's worth just closing with this. There is, he said, there is a gap between the probable and the proved. And we all know that gap. A gap between the probable and the proved. How was I to cross it? If I were to stake my whole life on the risen Christ, I wanted proof. I wanted certainty. I wanted to see him eat a bit of fish. I wanted letters of fire across the sky. I got none of these. And I continued to hang about on the edge of the gap. It was a question of whether I was going to accept him or reject him. My God, he wrote. My God, there was a gap behind me as well. Perhaps the leap to acceptance was a horrifying gamble, but what if, the, what if the leap to rejection? There might be no absolute certainty that Christ was God, but there was certainly no certainty that he was not. This was not to be born. I could not reject Jesus. There was only one thing to do once I'd seen the gap behind me. I turned away from it and flung myself over the gap towards Jesus. And, and that really is what Ruth was doing here. There, there's no certainty. There's no proven certainty. But the testimony is there, the experience of Moab, the message of what God has done, and the testimony of other Christians. And therefore, she flings herself over the gap towards Jesus. And that really is, is what you and I are called upon to do. That's how we step into life. Uh, we, we fling ourselves over the gap and entrust ourselves to him. Uh, and we do so on the back of that reflection that there's a gap behind me as well. It's a big leap of faith to reject Jesus, a big leap of faith to say he is not the son of God, he is not risen, and all this stuff is just a load of nonsense. It's a big leap of faith that when you're confronted by that experience, that testimony, and that message. May God enable us to take that step, to fling ourselves over the gap, and to find in Jesus life. May God bless his word to your heart, to all our hearts, and may you live that life in all its fullness. Amen.